I mean, one of the books that came out at the end of last year, uh, Abyss by Max Hastings about the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think is very compelling in saying how dangerous it is to be in a world where two superpowers that don't understand each other or are nervous about each other could easily move towards nuclear war, partly because of pressure from the two sets of military yeah. people. And Taiwan is obviously the potential trigger for, for this. Um, how do you think we should weigh this against the concerns of a purely economic kind where the Clinton administration, rather similar to the Brown Blair New Labour administration here, wanted to welcome China into the world trading system and assumed that it could sit around the same table and work together to resolve some of those issues. This, these two things seem very d different and the, the atmosphere around dealing with China that was there in the Clinton administration years has clearly been abandoned by both sides of politics in America. Well, the, I think the... I don't think that the decision to allow China to the WTO was a mistake, but the, uh, the terms on which it was accepted were obviously problematic in some important respects. And the most important was that there was no graduation procedure from its developing mm -hmm. country uh, um, status, and we should have had that. The, the bigger issue you raise is, you know, and this is what frightens me, if I'm going to talk about this, is that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we developed during the 70s and 80s, particularly the, a quite an elaborate apparatus for, for discussion with and communication with the Soviets. Uh, some of that was fraught, but nothing was ever as fraught as that again. Uh, and we sort of agreed what was not going to happen. So the, the fear of war really diminished rapidly, substantially, though the early 80s with the missile, inter intermediate missiles thing was quite tough. My understanding, this is not my specialist area, of course, but in my understanding is similar relations with the Chinese military and security establishment do not exist. There is very little knowledge of their in intentions. There's lots of provocations. And I think the chances of stumbling into war are, seem to me really quite high from what I read and hear. And the, uh, what we need to do is establish the limits mm -hmm. um, on both sides on what can and should be done. I think it's reasonably clear what those are, that basically the status quo should be left de facto without getting involved in de jure decisions. And certainly there mustn't be a war um, because the consequences are simply unimaginable. Yeah. Well, let's come back to something more purely economic and less terrifying. Um, when you talk about in the book about the rise of populism, to put it in that general way, you put a lot of weight on the impact of the financial crisis. You know, other authors have suggested there are other sort of explanations, but. I mean, you make a convincing case, in my view, for saying that the financial crisis was fundamental to this. Could you talk a bit about that? So my, I have a fairly comprehensive discussion of the theories of why populism has risen. Populism, by the way, very helpfully, is defined in two ways um, in the literature. One is simply an anti-elitist, anti an anti-elite sentiment, and uh, but the the more profound one is what one great one author calls anti-pluralism, that that the populist says not only that we're against elites, we're also against everybody who's different from you, and then you have a big problem because that's the point at which politics breaks down, and it's not very difficult to see what. The difference and where politicians lie on that. Uh, not just here. Uh, you know, I listen to the speeches of Marine Le Pen. So uh, um, populism comes for, in the first place from a hostility to elites. Now, I think part of that, 
is, uh, is a, um, uh, a long period, I argue decades, in which economic changes, some inevitable and some chosen, disadvantage relatively significant parts of our populations, most notably the industrial working class. And that was true uh, because deindustrialization was a revert universal feature. There were quite significant changes in income distribution, particularly at the top, um, and growth slowed as well. So the result of that is that the social position and economic position of the industrial working class transform, as well as huge cultural changes, hmm. which I think became more difficult to accept as their status became more threatened. That was already clear by the middle of the early 2000s. Then, papered over with the credit boom. This is Raghuram Rajan's, our friend Raghuram Rajan's view. Then the financial crisis happens, and that has two devastating consequences. First, most economic policy making is pretty remote from most people. They understand when interest rates rise, they understand something to do with people like you when you're at the Bank of England and so forth. But most of the time, these are just things that happen out there. A financial crisis is different. One, it's pretty obvious this is not supposed to happen. Two, it's pretty obvious who's responsible, namely bankers, financiers, and the institutions that are supposed to be in charge of bankers and financiers, apart from themselves, central banks and governments, right? And financial regulators. So they, these are the people in charge. They don't know what they're doing, do they? I mean, it's pretty obvious. You cannot have anything more demonstrative of the fact that the people in charge don't know what they're doing than a massive, monstrous financial. Then, to make it all worse, the governments come along and say, well, we're going to rescue all these people because otherwise it, we're in catastrophe land. So they, they put the entire balance sheets of the government at stake. They invest them, their taxpayer money in supporting the banks, and that keeps all, even keeps all their bonuses, for God's sake. And in the meantime, there's defaults, house prices collapse, uh, unemployment shoots up. That doesn't last forever, but it shot up like mad. And afterwards, then there's a third leg of it. The government says, well, we're broke now, so we've got to cut spending. And they say, well, we didn't do anything to cause that. That was you lot. Uh, um, and that then leads to the other huge thing, which I have, a, I think, is the best chart in my book. So if you take the GDP per head of the G7 countries, the major seven countries, the US, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, I'm sure I've missed one out, but anyway, Japan. So uh, Japan is sui generis, I won't go there. And you ask yourself the question, where is GDP per head in 2021? Where was GDP per head? The average relative to where it would have been if we'd continued the trend from 1990 to 2007. And I wonder how many people in this audience know where UK GDP per head in 2021 was relative to where it would have been if we'd continued the trend of 1990 to 2007 as we understood it. Well, the answer is it was 30% below. And that, by the way, is the second worst after Spain. It's even worse than Italy, but that's partly because its pre-crisis growth was already slow. York, US is 20% down. Yeah. Uh -huh. So we are much, much poorer. And a lot of that in, than people expected, and we're much poorer than people expected after these mess that the elites were seen to have created. And then the austerity came on top of it, which meant that the most vulnerable in society suffered. We put these things together. I think it's miraculous that the popular anger isn't greater. So in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, I organized dinners at the Bank of England. And I'd ask the various people attending why people are not more angry, because they weren't that angry. Um, and Partly it's because the measures taken meant that the rise in unemployment didn't persist for that long. But the point I tried to make at the time was, 
Go back to the 1930s. After the Great Depression, there were two tremendous sort of revolutions in thinking. One was in economics, when the economics profession either debated very hotly John Maynard Keynes's ideas. This was clearly a period of intellectual ferment. And in the general political world, people would debate whether we should have a communist society. You know, you have books about communism was the right way for Britain or the market economy is the right way for Britain. These were big questions, big issues. After our financial crisis, the economics profession did nothing, basically. There are a few wrinkles here, but there was no question of a, gosh, hadn't we better rethink how we see the economy behaving? And there was no real discussion of a radical political debate and agenda about what went wrong, what we should do. And the charts that you mentioned, these, these figures about GDP relative to where it would have been had we not continued on the pre-crisis trend. I showed these charts when I was teaching in New York. And you know, basically the students would say, well, that's why we're taking the course. You know, I lost my job in the crisis. That's why I signed up for your course. And the anger, it was obvious to me, would come out over a longer period. And that's exactly what's happened. And that's been true all, all over the developed world where there was a banking crisis. And by the way, when I went back to look at this and subsequent work has shown, there's uh, Alan Taylor particularly, who we, must, we both know, very distinguished British economist working in America, has done some wonderful research which shows that financial crises almost always lead to political upheaval. What is so depressing about this one, and I'm not sure I'm good enough to change this, is that instead of, well, we avoided you know, the fascist revolution, that's a good thing, um, or sort of, sort of. Uh, 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 you know, that's a I really loathe Donald Trump, let's be clear, he's not Adolf Hitler. So the, the, um, the uh, uh, we had no real intellectual ferment. So the ideas that have come of God for transformation on the left essentially look like very old, old. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and perhaps the criticism of me is that I'm too old, old too. So we, we need, but there's really been not much except yeah. with the green stuff a bit, uh, which we could discuss. Um, and in political terms, what has come out as clearly the strongest wave is a sort of anti-elite, anti-intellectual, right-wing populism, um, which is not as poisonous in terms of its, well, we, let's kill a few million people stuff. I'm very happy with that, uh, as the interwar period, but offers absolutely no relevant answer to any of the challenges. It's just changing the question. Instead of asking, well, we've got a system that isn't working for us, what do we do about that? Uh, as a coherent question, what should we, how should we be changing our policies, our programs? The political parties that have been successful and the movements have been successful basically said, we have no idea at all. Remember Donald Trump in 2022 uh, came to the, uh, stood for re-election with no manifesto. And by the way, that's basically what's going to be true of our to two political parties in the next general election. Because I've talked to them, it's pretty obvious. They have no program. No. And the, to be fair, Biden has, so that is, I give him credit for that, and at least he's trying to do something, you know, sort of, uh, uh, and I largely supported it, it's a lot, there's action. There's actually been some action in the EU, but the basic response of the rising political forces, which are right-wing, right-wing populism uh, with an autocratic tinge has been completely hostile to policy as such. And that is really frightening because the danger is you then get into the Latin American trap, which is you elect somebody like that, he or she does nothing good for you, so you get even angrier and go for somebody even crazier, and it becomes a vicious circle between the left-wing extreme and the right-wing extreme, and the, pop, the country becomes destabilized. You have to have political parties with bold and coherent programs, which you can believe in when you're in a situation like this, and that's the one thing we are clearly not getting. 
Right, so my next question is that the book itself and your comments just now, they're very trenchant, very persuasive critiques of so-called populist leaders. And I'm sure there aren't any populist leaders in the audience. Um, we're all members of the elite. And when we, you, Martin, you and I... I think speak for yourself, No, Martin, maybe. you are. Whenever you and I go to you know, international conferences or meetings, what you get, obviously, or everyone criticizing the populist leaders, saying how dreadful they are, etc. But what advice would you give to the elites? Well, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question because it's the, the question of how uh, um, political reform, policy reform can happen. Um, so the obvious answer is there are two elements to this because there are many different elements of the elite. There have to be political leaders who are prepared to and able to sell new programs. Um, uh, and I, you know, I've become very, very convinced since I can't provide it at all because I'm hopeless. Um, that, that's a miraculous talent which either you get or you don't. So I've actually become convinced, for example, that the world was unimaginably lucky that Franklin Delano Roosevelt came along in the early 30s. And it's very easy to imagine a world in which he didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and his attitude to all this, we've got to make changes and we're going to make lots of experiments and some of them won't work. Um, so, uh, and in the British case, crucially, in avoiding the Great Depression, we had Keynes, and, and uh, his arguments and others got us off gold, which actually was the single most important decision we took. But that was quite revolutionary. We abandoned it forever. Yeah. You know, sacred pillar, gone. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so we need, you need leadership and you need politicians who ultimately accept this. But you also need ideas. I've tried to produce some, but I fear that mine are perhaps not radical enough. But I do think it's become really, and I, this is the difficult, it's become quite difficult in the sense that, and I can go to this in detail, but it'll take quite a long time, so I won't do it now, that the, the constraints upon us in terms of what we can do are different from the constraints we had in the middle of the 20th century. And if we're going to have a dramatic growth transformation, it will have to come from a, it has to be led by something technological which will radically improve our policy options. And the most obvious one is an energy revolution. Uh, and that's certainly, I think, Americans are right to go for that and invest in that big time. And I think we should be doing the same. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, is a two-edged sword. We don't know what that will do for us, but I think we're going to have to use it if we're going to get more uh, activity. I don't believe we're going to be able to sell degrowth or the end of growth as a political solution. I discussed that. But we, would, we have to do what we can to accelerate uh, technical progress, radically increase investment, both private and public, in our society, radically improve um, the institutions that support um, decentralization of political and economic power, and we have to take some gambles. I find that all very persuasive. I'll give you one example. You mentioned AI. AI could transform the National Health Service. Uh, it's not something that's been discussed in terms of how we organize the NHS. We simply talk about targets for money and people. That could be, it's not clear that's a sensible way to think about it. So that there are, and energy too, but there are these big ideas that are not coming forward as the main platforms for our parties. And then I've got my own famous things. We've got to radically shake up the housing markets. Yes. That means the land markets, and we have to introduce yeah. a land tax, which I'm going to discuss on my column on Monday. The, the, the point I think that is crucial is if you look at it intellectually and politically, the politics of the democratic, major democratic countries has become quite unbelievably small c conservative. Yes. In policy terms, yeah. not in terms of rhetoric yeah. or, or, or uh, contestation or hostility or anger, but in policy terms, 
there's almost nothing going on. And if that continues, then I just don't see how anything good can come out of where we are. So I've got one last question before we throw it open. So get your questions ready for Martin. Uh, you talk quite a lot in the book when thinking of the cure, what we could do about the importance of trust in a democratic society, about how we interrelate to other members of the same community. In short, about citizenship. And indeed, the last chapter of the book is called Restoring Citizenship. Can you say something about what your view of citizenship is? Well, this is where my views have developed most or changed most or whatever in the process of writing this, which is sort of embarrassing in a way. I mean, the obvious point is because I took it for granted. Basically, as a young person growing up here in the 50s and 60s, I took all this for granted. What is a democracy ultimately? What makes it meaningful? Well, go back to the Greek city-states for all the limitations. Um, it's a community defined by where they live, because it's always territorial, who share a, and think of themselves as sharing a common destiny. We shared institutions, mutual responsibilities, which has included historically fighting for the country if necessary, mm -hmm. um, in which you accept outsiders to join you, but they join you as part of this political community. And if democracy is to work, crucially, there has to be a loyalty to the, the body politic as a whole, including its institutions, which overrides your loyalty to your party, to your side. Otherwise, every election becomes a civil war. And what you're trying to do in a democracy is precisely to manage disagreement and dispute yeah. without having a civil war. So to do that, you have to have, and sometimes you do get them, as we saw in America in the, in the 1860s. So to do that, you need to generate a quite deep sense of mutual trust around symbols, and there are lots of obvious ones about what the, his, the shared history means, and that should be based as far as possible on reaching for truth, on the shared values that you, your democracy represents, um, something that our predecessors would have quite comfortably called patriotism, but we'd probably call it something else now. Without that, you don't have a democracy. You have a civil war. And the many countries have ended up there. Um, and some countries are ending up there now with democracies, and mostly not in the developed world yet. But as I said, America looks a bit like this. So to do that, you have to restore a sense of citizenship. So I think quite a bit about how to do that. I, mean, I, have some, I even have really, really wild ideas, like the idea that, well, maybe some form of national service will be required, not necessarily military. Maybe we have to rethink what we've let the media do. And as I said, maybe we can use uh, this wonderful institution, the jury, as a, mo as a, as a template which, yep. uh, around which we can build other institutions which help bring us together because ordinary people are more actively engaged in it. So I think we need to be quite radical about how we think about restoring that sense of being part of, uh, of one thing. And I also discuss how you manage immigration in this context. I understand this is the most explosive part, but I don't think we can contemplate restoring democracy without thinking quite hard about what makes us feel we're citizens. And I start, yeah. by the way, uh, many of my lectures, and I have in it a fantastic quote from Aristotle, who was, after all, the first political scientist, and he has this marvelous quote from the politics, in which he says, essentially, is you can't have a stable, democratic constitution without a thriving independent middle class. That's a pretty modern sense and I actually thought more and more about that. That's what you need and that's what we've been losing. Well now it's the time.